All right. Welcome, folks. Uh, if you are joining us from wherever you are joining us, if you are joining us, he says, I mean, of course, people are joining. That's why they're in the in the room. <laughs> um, it is it is starting to get cold in Cape Town. So my brain is not functioning 100% lately. So I apologize for that. Uh, but as you are joining, um, if you'd like to let us know in the chat where you are joining us from. Um, it's always interesting to see folks where they're, where they're from in the world and maybe let us know what time it is there where you are and what the weather's looking like. Uh, Cape Town is, is cold and wet today. So we're starting to see winter coming around. Uh, Patricia is from Geneva, Switzerland. And it's the same time in Geneva as it is here. It's always fun when I meet folks in Europe who are on a similar time zone. Uh, I see some familiar faces there. Arta from Germany, welcome. Larry from Texas, welcome. Valerie from OK, which I'm going to assume is Oklahoma. Um, welcome, Valerie. Right. Okay. So while while folks are joining and letting us know where they're from, hi there, Shabam from India. It's 7.30 there. I appreciate you being online so late this evening. Um, today's session is going to be the first of a few sessions over the next few weeks uh, that have to do with, with WordPress multi-site. Um, WordPress multi-site or a multi-site network is something that I have had a fair amount of experience with. Uh, it's not been my primary level of experience, but I have done some work on multi-site networks as a developer, um, specifically creating either specifically a theme or a child theme for a multi-site network. And I'll I'll dive into that in a second as sort of how that worked um, when we go over the examples. And also working as a plugin developer, having to uh, take into account whether a plugin is on a multi-site network or not. Uh, one of the first times that I heard about WordPress multi-site was when I was developing my one of my very first plugins. Um, oh, Oki, Valerie says Oki. Oki. Okay, cool. Um, that's pretty. That's pretty cool. Um, and one of the first support questions that I ever had was, "Does this support multi-site?" And I had to go and do some some digging into how to make a plugin support multi-site. Um, so today we're going to start looking at what a multi-site network is, uh, how to set one up, and then over the next few series, um, we're going to then look at developing for multi-site, specifically thinking about multi-site networks. Uh, so today is going to be a little bit less of the coding side of things and more of me discussing things and talking about things and sharing some sort of background for those who don't know what multi-site is. Um, and then we're just going to go through through some steps. So I will introduce myself very quickly. Uh, my name is Jonathan, as I, as I may have mentioned earlier. I'm not sure now. I can't remember. For those of you who don't know me, I am from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I am a developer educator at Automatic and I'm sponsored to work with the training team. Uh, a few announcements before we get going, as always. Uh, first of all, welcome to everybody joining us today, and welcome and thank you to Thelma, who is co-hosting with me here today. Uh, it's always always a pleasure to have Thelma here. Thelma is a fellow fellow automatician and a fellow uh, living in South African, uh, but Thelma is originally from Zimbabwe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually okay. in Harare right now also. Oh, you are, oh you're in Harare right now? Oh, sorry. I yeah, thought yeah. you were still in, in Cape Town. My apologies. Okay, so Thomas is Zimbabwe. I apologize. Living in Zimbabwe <laughs> at the moment. Living in Harare. Sorry, yeah. I thought you were still living in Cape no, Town. No, it's okay. I'm always there, <laughs> so I get the confusion. Okay, okay. Um, as we as we go on, if you can't see what's on screen while we're presenting, please do let me or Thelma know. Um, and we will. There, there is a bug that we picked up specifically with folks joining from uh, Linux workstations. So if you ever can't see what I'm sharing on screen, please let me know. And what we just do is we reset the screen share, and that usually fixes fixes things. Um, I just want to, uh, yeah, okay. Um, as always, we are presenting in focus mode. But if you would like to, you're welcome to enable your video. Uh, focus mode just means that, okay, Victor says he can't see. So that's perfect. That's exactly what I need to know. So let me stop the screen share. 
uh, if I can remember how that works. Oh, wait, hang on. Maybe I haven't actually shared the screen. Um, no, it says here I am sharing. So let's stop the share. There we go. And let me close down whatever that window was. And let me screen share again. Um, hang on. Things have... Okay. Things are not doing what I'm used to them doing. So there we go. Apologies for that. Right. So Victor, can I just confirm that you can see the announcement slide right now? Um, if you can confirm that for me, that will be great. And then we'll be able to, to move on. Okay. Adrian can see it. Uh, while I'm waiting for Victor to respond, Victor is from Buenos Aires. Victor says you can see it. Excellent. Valerie's only. Oki from Stillwater. Okay. Okay from Stillwater. Okay. Great. Okay. We're all caught up. Um, so yes, that is that is something we picked up a while back. That if you are joining from a Linux workstation, if if the, if you join the Zoom chat, or the Zoom meeting after the screen share has been enabled, then you might not see it. So if you're joining any other online workshops that are hosted using Zoom and you can't see it, just let the speaker know that they just need to disable and re-enable screen share, and that fixes the problem. Um, Cool. You're all, you're, as always, you are welcome to ask questions at any point in time. Uh, you're welcome to post questions in the chat or unmute to ask questions. Um, today is not going to be such a code-heavy session. So I, while I will still leave breaks for specific questions, you are welcome to ask me as we're going along. It's going to be a little bit more of a conversation today, but more of a, a, a chat as opposed to a code-heavy session. Um, so you are always welcome to ask questions at any point in time. Um, Lisa says, wasn't able to download the slides. Um, so the slides are usually sh shared on SlideShare. Um, and if I didn't, let me just check if I pasted the right link or not. Um, did I not paste that? I apologize if I didn't. Uh, I thought I had, but it's very possible that I hadn't because sometimes I create things and then don't hit post. Um, so let me go to the Meetup page quickly and check that. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. I posted the message, but not the actual link to the slides. My apologies. So while you're here with me, we can go and get those very quickly. Um, that's rather, as you can see, this Cape Town, this winter weather in Cape Town is affecting my brain. Um, so let me find those slides very quickly. Uh, let's stick on the sharing button here. There we go. And let me grab the link. Um, and I'll copy that. And then I will go back to the meetup URL. And I will reply and post them there so that folks can get them there. And I will post them in the chat um, so that everybody can get them there. There we go. OK, uh, I apologize for that, folks. Uh, the slides aren't super, super important today, but you're welcome to download them now or later if you would like to. Um, OK, no problem. Uh, OK. Um, right, then. If you do want to work along with me today, please make sure your local install is ready. There is a caveat to that statement, which I will get to in a second. Um, so depending on what local environment you're using might determine how the workshops differ slightly for you. I'm going to try and cover all of the options I can think of. Um, but if you are going to work along with me today, have your local WordPress install ready. I do recommend having a clean WordPress install ready because um, that's the way to set up a multi-site, which we will chat about in a second. Uh, but if you want to have that uh, up and running, do let me do, do have that ready. Um, as always, if I'm going too fast, which I do tend to do, please do let me know either in the chat or raise your hand in the in the Zoom uh, emotions or just you know unmute and say, hey, Jonathan, slow down. Um, I will do my best to to stay as measured as I possibly can. Uh, and then finally, I will be posting the session to WordPress.tv afterwards. I am recording. Uh, yes, I am recording, uh, so you'll be able to get it there if you want to watch it later, uh, or if anybody who wants to, who couldn't make it today will be able to watch it there. All right, our learning outcomes today, we're going to focus on what is a multi-site network. So if you've never heard of multi-site today, I'm going to try and do my best to give you a short introduction to a multi-site network and why it could be useful for a future project. Uh, we'll then talk about why you might consider using a multi-site network and under what circumstances you might consider doing that. 
I'll then show you some examples of multi-site networks, specifically projects that I've worked on. Uh, one very big one that I work on every day, uh, which some of you may guess, um, and then a few others that I've worked on in the past. And I'll I'll chat briefly about what I did on those projects and, how, and, and why I thought they were interesting. And then lastly, we'll go through the steps of setting up a multi-site network uh, yourself. Okay, um, so those are all the announcements and the things that we need to cover today. I just want to, before I get started, just want to check if anybody has any questions or anything else they want to let me know that they can't see or they need access to before we get started. Uh, I'm just going to check the chat and make sure I didn't miss any comments or anything. Uh, I think it was just the slides. Uh, Victor was saying he's from Buenos Aires. Um, okay, so Valerie was saying Oki, Oki from Muskogee, Oklahoma. Okay. Right, um, got that. All right, I think we're all caught up there, so that's great. Okay, so <laughs> first question of the day, what is a multi-site network? And the great thing about WordPress is that it has a documentation page. Um, so the article that I was mentioning, uh, or at least the documentation that I was mentioning is this one over here. I will share this in the chat once I've opened it up so that you're welcome to open it up as well on your side. Um, but this is a, a article in the WordPress documentation that talks about how you create a network. Um, and you'll often see it is referred to as a multi-site network or just multi-site or a network of sites. Uh, and you'll see that on this page, it's referred to as a network. And it says you're, you have the ability to create a network of sites using the multi-site feature. Um, so... I am not, so I'm going to go back to um, Eleanor's question about could you explain the minimum hardware requirements to create a multi-site network. My understanding, uh, and if you read, I'm not going to read through this whole document now, but if you read through this document, there is this um, before you create a network uh, link as well, which is also linked in my slides, but we'll open that up and I will copy and paste that for you in the chat as well. Um, there are Specifically under the server requirements section, they don't talk specifically about anything to do with the hardware itself. So theoretically, you can run a multi-site network on whatever type of setup you could run a single site or a single install or a standard install of WordPress on. Um, however, when we dive into multi-site in a second, we talk about what it is and how it works. We need to remember that a multi-site network is effectively a collection of websites. And so the more websites that you have on your hosting account or your hosting package or whatever the case may be, the higher your requirements are going to be because you're going to have maybe more people hitting your site, um, more things happening, things happening across the network and those kind of things. So the minimum requirements are exactly the same as the minimum requirements for WordPress. Uh, but as your site scales, you might need to update and increase your requirements as, as you move along. But in terms of minimum requirements, they are whatever the requirements are for WordPress itself, uh, which we can find on the WordPress.org website under, uh, I think it's under Get WordPress somewhere. Uh, they talk about the minimum requirements. It might be installation. It's been a while since I've looked for this, this piece of documentation. Um, let me just... Uh, here we go. So the requirements on the server side are PHP 7.4 or greater, MySQL 5.7 or greater, and HTTPS support. And those are the minimum requirements. In terms of hardware itself, um, I mean, I have I've run WordPress sites on shared hosting. I've run WordPress sites on DigitalOcean. Um, it doesn't need much to get going. You know, it requires very little in terms of in terms of sort of minimum requirements. Um, but obviously, again, the bigger your site gets, the higher the traffic is, the more you need memory and CPU cycles and all that kind of thing. But those are the minimum requirements. Okay. Um, so the important thing to understand about a multi-site network is that it is a collection of sites, so multiple different WordPress sites, but it uses the same core WordPress files. So it uses the same admin files, the same WP include files. Those of you who joined me on our walk through the WordPress lifecycle last week, we looked through the config and then the includes and the blog header and all of those. It uses all of those same, same local files. Um, the difference is, is that once it's installed and active, it sets up a few extra tables in the database. Uh, and there are a few extra things that you set up yourself in, in the config file if, if you're doing it yourself. And you can then run multiple WordPress sites on a single install. 
Um, one of the very first uh, sort of projects that I tried to kick off when I became, uh, when I when I sort of went from being employed to being a freelance uh, developer, was I set up something called um, SciWeb Sites, which was a very simple WordPress multi-site install that I set up and I enabled folks to create their own websites. Um, and it was just my kind of way of trying to get into sort of letting people easily create sites for themselves who weren't technically minded. Um, it was my sort of initial attempt at, you know, being an entrepreneur. But you will see on this document, it talks about the fact that a multi-site network can be very similar to your own personal version of WordPress.com. Uh, so those of you who don't know, WordPress.com is the is the uh, service that automatic hosts to set up WordPress sites. And that, effect, that effectively is just one big multi-site install. Um, with a multi-site, you can enable it so that end users can get to your, your domain, your top-level domain, whatever the case may be, and then register their own sites inside of your multi-site network. Or you can switch that setting off and you can only create sites as, as, as an administrator user. Um, all sites on a multi-site network can also use the same plugins and themes. Um, you effectively you install the plugins and themes on the on the core site, the initial site, and then you enable it across the network. Um, and so you can then say this plugin is only available on this site, and, and this theme is available across all the sites, or however the case may be. Um, the the two the two sort of physical differences in terms of the multi sites and and each individual what's known as either individual sites or sub sites, is that the um, directories for media uploads are separate. So each individual site has its own separate media upload directory. Uh, and then the separate tables that I mentioned to you earlier, which we will dive into in a second. Um, okay. The next thing I want to chat about is why you might want to consider using a multi-site network. Um, so when you have a number of sites that are similar in nature, doing a similar kind of thing uh, that you need to keep separate from each other, but you want to manage them in one place, a multi-site network might be a good example of that or a good solution for that. Um, when you have a group of different sites that need to be managed by one admin, um, but you also need to be able to give different users control to only specific sites. Now, a good example of that might be a news company, uh, a, a local South African company called Times Media. They had four or five news portals and they ran that as a multi-site. So their main website was the main site. And then all of the news portals were different sites under that. Each site was a different company and only people within the different companies had access to their specific sites, but it was all under one multi-site umbrella. Um, or if you need this, to have a number of sites that belong to the same organization. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of, of what I'm talking about in the next slide. Um, so some examples that I've specifically worked on, my favorite is the last one. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Make WordPress sites, which are essentially the sites that all of the contributors who build and work and, and contribute to, to the WordPress project uh, work on are basically a bunch of multi-site networks. So make.wordpress.org is the main site. And then each team, so the core team, design team, accessibility, support themes, community, as we go through this whole list, I'm sure I've mentioned this to some of you before, um, each team within the WordPress project has its own subsite in the big multi-site. Um, and the really interesting and cool thing I think about that is, is that you can be a member of, for example, the training team and have full ad administrator access to all of the training team resources, but you don't therefore have access to all of the sites around your network. Um, so, so managing a, an open source project with, with multiple different teams, that is, sorry, I'm just, that is a perfect example of where a multi-site could come in handy. Um, another, another good example of uses of multi-site are, uh, higher education. So this is the website of the Arizona State University. Um, I don't know if anybody is near to Arizona. Uh, this is a site that I worked on a number of years ago, and they basically have um, a colleges and schools platform. Um, and then they have all of the colleges and schools listed, and each college and school has its own individual site in the multi-site. Um, so you'll see the top level domain here is asu.edu, 
but then if we open up the, the business one, it's wpcarry.asu.edu. So those of you who don't know, that's a subdomain of the asu.edu top level domain. Um, and every time they have a new college or a new school that needs to be created, they just quickly spin up a new subsite or individual site of the multi-site network, apply whatever theming they need to it, and they're and they're ready and off to the races. Uh, they have one web administrator that works for university that manages the multi-site, um, and he can do whatever he needs to all over the place. Okay. Um, Linda says, let's say you have a company that sells used cars. But each city has different cars, so to maintain continuity, you can create a multi-site with a subsite for each city so that they can update their unique stock of cars. Yes, that's that's a good example as well. Um, the one thing that I would mention, though, um, and this is not related to what Linda was saying, but it sparked my memory, uh, is that while <clears throat> the subsites or the individual sites, I'm going to I'm going to refer to them as subsites going forward, but they they are also called individual sites or single sites. I'll just call them subsites. Um, while they are part of a network, they are not connected to each other. So when you think of the word network, generally it's we're talking about networking, you know, a local area network or a wide area network. And that means all the computers can talk to each other. Um, a, a WordPress multi-site network, it just means that there are multiple sites running on the same WordPress install and being managed by a single admin user. It doesn't mean that the sites can talk to each other. Um, so you you can't necessarily say that if you're logged in on subsite A as user X, you would have direct, instant access to subsite B or whatever the case may be. Um, so depending on on your use case, um, if you need a site that has multiple different platforms, but the data needs to be interactive with each other, maybe a multi-site doesn't work for your specific requirements. Uh, so you need to kind of be able to think about like how is the data trans going back and forth. Uh, do, do the sites need to be able to interact with each other in terms of the data levels? Does does a page on site A need to be accessing data from site B? If it does, if that's the only reason you're thinking about multi-site, maybe multi-site is not the, not the best idea. Um, but there are also ways around that, so there are pros and cons to both. Uh, M says, how much carries from the main site into the subsites, and how much can be customized? Um, and when you say how much carries, do you mean uh, how much is inherited from the main site to the subsite? Uh, or are you talking about how much data is possibly transferred between the two? Um, I just want to make sure I understand your question there. While you're while you're responding to that, I'll talk about how much can be customized. Um, so you can effectively, when you think about the subsites on a multi-site install, you can do the same level of customization in terms of plugins and themes on the subsites as you do in a single site install. Um, I'll dive into that in a second, and I'll show you what I'm talking about there to be to be a little bit clearer. But you you aren't limited by by customization, by you aren't limited in terms of customization because you're running a multi-site install. Um, when you say how much carries from the main site, if you mean how much is inherited, um, let me when I've when I've set up my local multi-site install, let me let me dive into that a little bit better. It's easier to do it by way of an example. Um, so when we get there, I'll show you uh, kind of how that all works. So I, I have got that pinned and I will get back to that question. Um, okay. So while we're talking about examples of multi-site next works, the other one that I wanted to mention is Urban Justice. This is, I'm not mentioning this for any specific uh, reason other than this is a project that I worked on. Uh, they are a nonprofit organization and they have all these different projects that they, that they run. And each project site is its own individual site using a subdomain in store. Um, and the, the reason I mentioned these two projects is because as a, so the Arizona State University and Urban Justice Center, um, both of those projects were essentially running using a core theme, a parent theme. And then the parent theme was network enabled across all subsites. And then each site then had a child theme with all of the customizations. Um, and they would... The, specifically the Arizona State, Arizona State University, uh, this is a very clever thing, the way this developer, the original developer worked this, is the child theme was a single child theme, but then there were, were switches in the theme to check which site was being loaded and based on which site was being loaded, certain different either functionality or layout and design was being, was being loaded on the subsite. So instead of having, let's say they had uh, 20 subsites, Instead of having to manage 20 child themes, they managed one child theme and then just made sure they updated the code to check, well, which site is being loaded and based on that, that change, then load this functionality, which I thought was quite a clever and interesting way of doing things. Um, 
Similarly, the um, so that was that was the Urban Justice Center. Similarly, the Arizona State University, they had a child theme that they would load on every site, and that child theme was a child theme of another theme that was a page builder theme. So they would just load the child theme with their specific requirements in terms of I think it was fonts and color schemes and those kind of things off the base theme. And then they would use the page builder functionality of the theme to customize the site further. Um, so that I thought was another clever way of, of making use of this multi-site environment to very quickly spin up a new site, uh, apply the child theme so that all the fonts and letter spacing and all those things are automatically applied. And then all the users have to do is use the page builder functionality to change and create pages and those kind of things. So it does give you what is nice about that example is if you have an environment where you need to control the look and feel of your subsites in a specific way, you can do that through a multi-site install. Uh, you can you can give folks access and you can only enable certain themes and certain plugins for those subsites and then and then they can only do certain things. So that's another way to think about whether or not to use a multi-site install. Okay, I'm going to take a break there and have a sip of water. If there are any other questions around multi-sites and what they are and how they do things, uh, you can you can let me know um, while I refresh my throat. <laughs> So Linda asks, is Facebook basically a multi-site? Um, not, in, not in the way I think of multi-sites in terms of WordPress, um, because it was written from scratch by the original Facebook developers. Uh, I guess it's kind of like a multi-site in terms of the functionality that it, that it provides. It's the same core base code, and then you can have pages and posts and those kind of things, pages and your profile and those things. Uh, so I, I guess you could say it's similar in the way it works as a multi-site. Um, but uh, but not not the way I think about it as a WordPress multi-site. I, I wouldn't say that it's that. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, when it comes to setting up your multi-site, uh, depending on the web host that you use and the local development environment that you use will determine how you set up a multi-site. So I've got a few examples here that I'm going to cover with you. I'm going to share the first two links in the chat and then I'll open them up. Um, but for example, SiteGround, which is a WordPress, uh, or at least a website hosting platform that also supports WordPress, um, they use what I consider to be the manual process of setting up a WordPress multi-site, which is what we're going to dive into in a second. So you install a new WordPress install, and then they have some instructions on how you can convert that install to a multi-site. Um, Kinsta, on the other hand, and I, I would just mention, I just randomly selected web hosts for this. I just picked two. Uh, I don't use either Kinsta or SiteGround. So this is not Jonathan's recommendation for hosting. I literally just picked two examples of the two different options. Uh, Kinsta has this option where you can, and I'm, I've, I think I've, yeah, I've shared that in the chat, where there is, I'll scroll down a little bit here. There is a button that you click, a little checkbox that you tick, and you say, should we install WordPress multi-site when you're setting up a new site? Uh, and then you can choose whether you want a subdirectory multi-site install or a subdomain multi-site install. And I'll, I'll chat about what those two are in a second. Uh, so Kinsta has this auto installer process and you say multi-site enabled from the word go and then it sets it up as a multi-site from the word go. SiteGround, you, you create your default WordPress install and then you have to do some work to enable multi-site. Similarly, and again, I've just randomly picked two local WordPress uh, development environments as the examples here, I'm pasting those in the chat. So those of you who use local WP, uh, it has an option <clears throat> where you can enable multi-site for your local development site from the word go. So it has a setting and I'll scroll down here in a sec to get there. Here's what the screen looks like. So when you're setting it up, there's a little, there's a little advanced option and it says, is this a WordPress multi-site? And you can either say, no, it's not, or yes, it is, and it's a subdirectory site, or yes, it is, and it's a subdomain site. And then it creates the site for you there. Um, and then the other one that I've shared with you as well, um, Dev Kinster also has that sort of automated process. They have the subdomain multi-site set up. Um, and then things like MAMP and other things, I don't have a link for that because it was a YouTube video and I didn't want to have to worry about that in the, in the conversation. They follow the manual process. So... If you're using something that supports multi-site from the word go uh, with some kind of option somewhere, we're not going to be able to cover all of those today, unfortunately. So if you're using local WP, 
when you create a new site, you just say enable multi-site and it'll do all the work for you. Or if you're using DevKinsta, if you're using something a little bit more, let's call it traditional, and I don't mean it's in terms of old school, but just sort of following the more manual process, it'll just install WordPress for you. And then you will need to follow the steps that we're going to follow today to set it up. Um, I would, however, recommend that if you've never set up a multi-site from scratch yourself, uh, that you either find a example local environment or a test hosting environment where you can go through the process yourself because it will help you understand the steps that you need to follow and what those steps do and what changes they make. Uh, so today we will be following that manual process. Um, if you if you are using local WP, I don't know if you can just create a default WordPress install and then edit the files to make the changes. You're welcome to try today. I just I don't use local WP, so I can't recommend that you that you try that today. Uh, but you you're welcome to give it a try and see if you can change the WP config and possibly the HT access. I don't know if that's going to work. Um, the important things to understand is to be able to follow the manual steps. You need to be able to edit your WordPress core files, specifically your WP config file number one. Your hosting environment or your local development environment needs to support HT access support. Now, HT access is a specific configuration option that Apache, the Apache web server supports. Um, some, some local development environments and some web hosting environments use something called Nginx, which is a more modern uh, web server. And it is possible to set up Nginx so that it can support HT access files. Um, so you might need to check with your web host how that works. Um, most, and I, I say this under correction, but I would say the majority of web hosts that support the automatic method, like we spoke about earlier, the DevKinster way and the and the local WP way, it's because they're using Nginx. And with Nginx, you can't, if it doesn't support HT access, the, the rewrite rules have to be hard-coded in Nginx config files, which happens to reside on the server in a different location. So that's usually why they support that kind of setup uh, from the word go. And then optionally, if you want to have subdomain support or not. So let's chat about that very quickly. So if we go back to the Arizona, Arizona State University and you look at the WP Carey School of Business, you'll see that, as I mentioned earlier, the domain name is WP dot, uh, sorry, wpcarry.asu.edu. Um, I just had a little smile in my head because they've got WP in the front and it doesn't mean WordPress. It's obviously some person with the initials WP, but I thought that was quite funny. Um, so that's what's known as a subdomain. So the subdomain is the part before the first dot, and then the top level domain is asu.edu. Um, for subdomain to work, your server needs to support what's known as subdomain mapping. So that's a special config on the web server that says, if a subdomain URL is requested, what site does that belong to? Now, depending on your, your local development environments, if it doesn't support subdomain mapping, you may have to use what's known as the subdirectory install option. And the subdirectory install, I don't know of any in the wild. Basically, instead of having the asu.edu, actually, no, I do know some in the wild. The make WordPress sites is a good example of, of one in the wild. So here, the top level URL is make.wordpress.org. But if I click on, for example, the training site, you will see that it is a subdomain of make.wordpress.org is where the training site uh, resides. So it's not a subdomain because make is already a subdomain and it's using that to run the top level domain. So those are the two options you have when you install a, a multi-site. Um, obviously the subdomain option is cleaner. Uh, it sort of gives the site its own sort of home and its own sort of address on the web, uh, but the subdomain wor version works just as well. The subdomain, sorry, the not the subdomain, the subfolder, sorry or the subdirectory option. Um, the advantage of the subdirectory option is it doesn't require any special domain mapping. Um, you can just use it on any web host that supports your top level domain, and then you can have your subsites. So that's just something to think about when you're preparing, if you're working on a project that is using multi-site, is the client or the customer or whoever you're building it for needing subdomain support? Are they needing sub, are they happy with subdirectory support? And then you can take it from them. Okay. Um, M says, if you have a multi-site, can you break one or more subsites into its own site outside of the network? Okay. So my, I've never done this before, but effectively it is possible. However, the way the data is structured requires some work on your part. Um, there are plugins that you can use. There are migration plugins that I'm aware of 
that you can use to extract one site from another. There are also tutorials on the web that will work you through that process. Um, it's not something we can cover today. I don't have enough time to prepare that today, but if you would like to, I could I could prepare a workshop on that process. So we could take one of the subsites that I create today and we could break it off into its own site if you would like to see that process. So it is possible. Um, if you're using one of the off the shelf options, they'll enable it for you. If you're doing it manually, it's a little bit of work, but it is possible. And, and it might be a good idea to, to set up as a, as, a, as a future workshop. So if you think that's a good idea, let me know um, and I'll prepare that one. But yes, it, it is possible to do that. All right. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm gonna go through the steps that are needed to, to set up a multi-site install for yourself. This is sort of the way things used to be done before we had you know, Nginx, before we had managed WordPress hosts. Um, by default, WordPress was just installed on the server for you using something like, uh, what was it called? Scriptaculous, I think it was called, or some, there was, I remember it was a cPanel thing that would auto install the WordPress version for you. I remember you would click it, you could install PHP BB and WordPress and Joomla and Drupal and all these things. I can't remember the name of it, but I know it was a cPanel module. Um, but essentially you would take your single WordPress install and you would convert it to a multi-site. And that's what we're going to be doing today. So the article or the documentation we're going to be working on is the first one that I shared with you. So let's go back to that. Uh, I did share it in the chat, but I will share it again. Um, it's this creating a network documentation. They do say that before you begin, uh, it is a good idea to read the before you can create a network page where they talk about, and that was the other one that uh, I shared with you, which I will share with you again. Um, and that one just covers the sort of high level requirements. So we're going to go over them very quickly. The first question it asks is, do you really need a network? Uh, and it talks about how these things work and it gives some examples about when it would be a good idea to use multi-sites and when not. So I do recommend reading that. Then it talks about the types of network and we have covered that briefly, but it talks about the subdomain option uh, or the or the subdirectory option. So subdomain, each site has a different subdomain, for example, site one, site two example. Or the other one has a different path, example.com site one, example.com site two. We're going to be following the subdirectory method today because I don't have subdomain mapping enabled on my local development environment. If I want to do a subdomain install, I have to create individual records for each of the subdomains, and I haven't got around to automating that yet. Um, so we're going to be following the subdirectory path. Then it talks about admin requirements. It says to create a multi-site network, you must be the administrator of the WordPress, the initial WordPress installation. You need access to the service file system, which I've mentioned, uh, which is specifically the config file and the HD access file. Uh, you don't necessarily need specific knowledge of WordPress, PHP, and those kind of things, uh, but it does help. <laughs> uh, and then server requirements, it specifically talks about things that are installed on the server. The majority of these things are installed by default. It's very rare that you will find a web host today in 2023 that doesn't have these things installed. Uh, but it does talk about HT access support or a way to write to those config files, the mod rewrite um, package to be loaded on Apache, and then certain settings to be set up, uh, follow some links and those things. So if you find your multi-site doesn't work on your web host, you can ping your web host and chat to them about these things. Um, and it talks a bit more about, the, here it talks about the DNS records and those things for setting up the domain mapping and the path mapping. Um, and then it also talks here about uh, giving WordPress its own directory. So it is possible, and we mentioned this in, in previous workshops, it's possible to move certain files around, move your WP config file around and change some settings on your WordPress site. Um, and it's kind of slightly different from the default install. And, it, and so this section talks about that. If you have if you have moved WordPress into its own separate directory, sort of higher than the root level, then there are certain things you need to be aware of. So the documentation is all there, which is great. It also talks about some restrictions. Uh, you can't create a network if your WordPress address is not using port 80 and 443. 80 is the default port on the server for all HTTP traffic. 443 is the default port for all HTTPS, or so secure HTTP traffic. Um, and you cannot choose a subdomain install in certain specific uh, instances. So it's a good idea to make sure we understand all of those. Um, so read through that if you're, if you're planning on setting it up. All right. Once we've covered the requirements, we can actually start preparing WordPress. And the first thing it says is make sure you back up your databases and files. Um, my recommendation is don't ever create a WordPress multi-site from a WordPress site that's active. 
uh, rather create a new multi-site and then move things around if you need to and import some data if you need to. Uh, because if things go wrong during the installation and you lose data, then it's a mission to restore all of that. So try and prepare before the project to say, right, this is going to be a multi-site, so let's do it from day one, from the from the get-go and, and go from there. Uh, you also need to make sure that pretty permalinks work, which again, most web hosts do support these days. Uh, you can check that very quickly. I'm going to log into my specifically set up a multi multipress.test local site. Um, and, and making sure that they are working is simply a case of going into your settings, going into the permalink setting, and just switching it to any one of the uh, permalink options, saving the changes, and then making sure that works on the front end. So if I go to a single blog post, for example, hello world here, I should see a permalink as opposed to a query stringed URL. Um, so make sure that's working. And then it also recommends that you deactivate all active plugins. And the reason for that is your plugins, What when you create the multi-site network, you've got the main site, which is the top level site, and then you have all of the sub-sites and you will need to be able to activate the plugin on both the main site and the sub-sites, which is what's called network activation. And so it's a good idea to have them deactivated up front and then reactivate it after the change. Um, okay, so that's all the sort of the configuration and the setup and things. Then it says, right, now we need to enable multi-site and here's where we start coding. So the first thing we do is we open up the WP config file. I'm gonna open up my code editor quickly so we can see what that looks like. Uh, this is my WP config file here. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger if I can. Why is my, there we go. And there we go. Um, so most of you, I think, know what the config file looks like. It's the place where your database credentials are stored. Um, it has any, any other config, uh, any other configuration con constant set up where you enable debugging, debugging. And then here, there is a section where it says, add any custom values between this line and the stop editing line. And that's where we're gonna work exclusively today. So the first thing that you do is you add this constant to your WP config. I'm gonna just copy this out. Sorry, I'm just gonna disable this little, um, this is a little uh, chat GPT extension that I'm going to uh, just disable very quickly because it's getting in the way. Um, ah, no, it's not going to the manage extensions page. Come on. Uh, there we go. And let's just disable that. It's, this is very handy. It, it helps me explain things when I'm searching on the web. Um, so check that one out if you're interested. Um, so it's this, it's this code here. So define allow WP allow multi-site true. So we copy that code out, hop on over into my, into my WP config. And there I've got define WP allow multi-site true. That's the first change that I make. Now, what that will do is that will, in the WordPress dashboard execution, if that constant is enabled or if that constant is created, it will enable a specific option in my, in my WordPress settings. Um, so once that code is added to my WP config file, I switch back to my WordPress site and I go back to the dashboard. And now there is an additional item in, sorry, not in settings, in tools. So if I hover over the tools menu item, there's a network setup option. I click on that and it takes me to a page where it says, right, you want to enable multi-site for the site. So as you can see, this is not something you can do from within the dashboard. It's specifically only if you can edit that WP config uh, because you don't want any user or any admin user to necessarily be able to do this. You want somebody who knows what they're doing to be able to enable this. So it requires that little bit of knowledge of how to add the files to the WP config and access as well. Um, and it says fill in the information below you need and it gives you some, some details. And the first option is the subdomain option, which is what most folks use because they like that clean URL. Or below that is the subdirectory option. That's the one I'm going to use today because I don't have domain mapping set up, as I mentioned. So all my subdomains are going to break. Uh, if you select subdomain, it actually goes through the process of checking whether it can access a subdomain on your top level domain. And if it can't, it gives you a warning. Uh, so for today, I'm going to select subdirectories. Then it just confirms the address is multisite.test or multipress.test, which is what I do have there. I can give the network a title. So it, it defaults to multipress sites. I can change that if I want to. And then I, it gives me a question about, uh, or at least a field to put in for the admin email address for the network admin. So remember, we can create administrators in the individual sites, but we have the network admin that controls everything. 
So I'm going to leave that as default and I'm going to say install. This then runs a few things in the background and then says to me, right, now you need to make some more changes. And the very first thing it says is you should back up your existing WP config and HD access files now. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're going to make changes to those files. I'm not going to back them up now, uh, but if you are doing this on your, on, your, on your site or on your web host, it's a good idea to do so. So the first thing it tells me is I need to add some more configuration settings to my WP config. So I'm going to copy those out very quickly. Uh, it's basically, and we'll talk through what each, each one of those is doing. So the first thing is I've got to leave the WP alarm multi-site. So that I've got to leave as true. And then I've got to add all of these other ones. Uh, and I'm basically saying multi-site is true. So this is a multi-site. Uh, it's using the sub, it's not using the subdomain installs, it's using the subdirectory install. So we've set that to false. It takes the current URL as the domain current site and sets that up. It sets the path. So if the path is different, if we've moved it to a WordPress directory that's different from the root, it'll, it'll set that up. Then it sets up the site ID current site to one, which is the current site, and the blog ID current site to one, which is the current site. It's the same value. Um, now, if you have, for example, created different subsites and whatever else, those numbers might be different, but usually it defaults to one if this is a clean WordPress install. Okay, so that's the first thing that I need to do. The second thing I need to do is I need to add this detail to my HD access directory. Uh, sorry, HD access file. And you'll see it says specifically I need to replace the other WordPress rules. So by default, let me show you what my HT access looks like by default. By default, if you if you have a default WordPress install and it was able to create the HT access file on installation, this is what it looks like. Sometimes I've, I've had this on local WordPress install. Sometimes it doesn't create this file and I need to go and find it on the web and then I copy and paste it in here. But this is what it should look like. And it's everything between this if module mod rewrite part. So it's everything from rewrite engine on to the last rewrite rule that I have to replace. So going back into my uh, setup page, I'm going to copy all of this out. You see it starts rewrite engine on, and then there's the last rewrite rule, and you'll see those two are the same, but in between things are changing, things are very different. Uh, yours might be slightly different to mine, depending on your local environment and your local setup. But then I replace all of that code with what was given to me with the network settings. And those are the two changes, the two big changes that I have to make. Now, I remember the first time I had to do this. Um, I knew that I was changing config settings and I knew that I was changing server level settings. So I was very nervous the first time I did it. So I do recommend the first time you do this, do this on a local WordPress install that supports it uh, so that you can understand how it works and, and how the process goes. Um, if you're not sure of what local development environment to use, if the one you're using doesn't support you, the ability to make these changes, just look for any environment that allows you to edit, for example, the HD access or the WP config and create the multi multi press install yourself. MAMP, I think, allows you to do it. Uh, I know Laragon, somebody mentioned Laragon in the meetup chat. That one's a little bit more sort of Laravel focused, but you can install WordPress sites on Laragon. That should enable you to do it because it's using sort of default server level things. Um, it's a good idea to sort of go through this process once and understand what all the pros and cons are. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go back here. Once that's done, you'll see right at the bottom of here, it says, once you complete these steps, your network is enabled and configured and you will need to log in again. Now, before we do that, I want to show you something in the database level. So let me just quickly log into my local um, database installation here. I'm using PHP my admin locally. And I want to show you two things. So this is the learn press site that I usually use for my demos. And you'll see it has 12 tables. Uh, users, user meta, blah, 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 all the way up to comment meta. And I'm going to leave this open over here. I'm going to actually zoom in a little bit so we can kind of see it a little bit bigger. Uh, zooming doesn't seem to be working for me right now. So let's do that. There we go. So there we can see the list of those tables. If I open my multi-press uh, multi site over here uh, and we click on it, you'll see that it has more than 12 tables. Uh, in fact, it has 18 tables. So it's already installed the additional six tables needed for a multi-price net, multi-price multi-press, multi-site flip, <laughs> multi-site network to work. So once we, um, let me go back to my code. Once we added that first uh, configuration setting and we refresh the dashboard and it gave us that page and said, you're ready to set things up and we hit enter, then it created all of that, all of that, all of those tables. Um, so it's a good idea to understand what those tables are and what some of them are doing. 
So if I scroll up to the right here, I'm keeping LearnPress open so we can see the original tables that a WordPress install would have. And then I want to keep this one on screen so we can see the 18 that are here. You'll see that, uh, I think this is all of them, yes. You'll see that new tables include WP Blog Meta and WP Blogs. Um, comment Meta and Comments is the same. Links is the same. Options is the same. Post Meta and Post is the same. Registration Log is new. Uh, signups is new because you can allow folks to sign up to create sites. Uh, WP site is new and WP site meta is new. Terms terms and terms meta is the same. Relationships and taxonomy is the same and user meta and users is the same. So those are all the new tables that have been added. If we have a look at, for example, the blogs table, you'll see that we have site ID one, blog ID one, multipress.test. So that's the first site that we've created. I wanna show you when we create a new site, what changes there. Uh, and then we have metadata associated, which there isn't any yet. Uh, we have signups, there aren't any yet. We have registrations, there aren't any yet. Um, but that's what gets created. And then it says you will have to log in again. So if you try to refresh your dashboard page now, it will log you out. And the reason it logs you out is because the cookie that is stored in your browser is assigned to your single site install. The minute you convert to a multi-site install, the cookie that it looks for to check if you're the network admin, the key changes. So it looks for that key, doesn't find it, and logs you out. So you need to log in as the administrator again. Once you log in, you will see that things are quite different. Um, so let me just, okay, this page is the same. It gives you all this detail just to make sure that you're still here. But if you click on your dashboard link now, uh, you'll notice that, for example, you suddenly have the sites menu item. You have a users menu item, themes, plugin settings, and that's it. There's no more posts, there's no more pages. Those are all belonging to the individual sites. So you still have your first level site that you created, the default site, uh, that you can manage and create posts and pages and themes and plugins and all of that. But then you can now create additional sites in your network. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the sites option over here, and this goes to all sites. And there is the what's known as the main site. So that's basically the data of the first site in the original tables. I'm then going to add a new site. So I can never think up fun names for my new sites. So I shall call him Bob. Um, <laughs> and the site title shall be Bob. And we'll leave the language as English. And we'll just make the email Bob at multipress.test. Uh, and it says a new user will be created if the above email address is not in the database, which I know it isn't. And the username and password will be sent to that user. So let's add that site. OK. If we now click on all sites, now we have two sites. We have the main site, which is still multipress.test, and we have multipress.test slash Bob. If I open up multipress.test, uh, sorry, let me go back one step here. Let me visit the site. Um, I can see whatever's installed on multipress.test. And if I open up and visit Bob, the front end, uh, it has the same, there's the copy of the data. It's not the same data. It's basically a new WordPress install with a new default data, new default theme, etc. Let's go back to the database and see what's happening there. So if we refresh MultiPress, uh, sorry, I've got some things over my screen here. Um, no, that's not what I want. Here we go. Now you'll see suddenly we have 28 tables. So additional tables are created every time you create a new site on a MultiPress install. And you will see that those tables are right at the top here. And they have the, in this case, WP underscore two, because it's the second site. So it's given the ID of two because the previous one was one. And then it has comments and comment meta, links, options, posts and post meta, terms and terms meta, term relationships, term taxonomy. So all of those tables are only belonging to site number two. Uh, I see your question there, Em, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so now when you create content on site two, for example, in this case, Bob. So now I'm logged in as Bob, uh, as the Bob admin, and I go to the dashboard, and now this looks like a normal WordPress install that I'm used to. And I can go to my posts over here, and I'm gonna go to the first one, and I'm going to say here, uh, let's go, sorry, for some reason it's not selecting. Let's say, hello, Bob. Uh, and we just keep it super simple so we can see that change. And now if we go back and we go and visit the Bob site, we will see now, hello, Bob, on the Bob site. So multipress.test multi Bob. But if we go back to the original multipress site, that's still using the original content. So there you can see how the different tables affect the different sites.
Um, the other thing to note that I wanted to show you quickly before I get to M's question is if you go to the blogs uh, table, you will see now it's created a record for the new site. Because it's the second one in the list, it's auto, auto incremented the blog ID. So first site, the main site is blog ID one, the second site is blog ID two. Uh, they all belong to site ID one. So your site ID is your whole, your network of sites. Um, and it stores things like the path. And then this is what this number, this ID here is what is used to create the prefix for your second site's tables. So if we created a third site, it would be ID three. And then all those tables with WP underscore three would be created. Uh, if we deleted three and then created a new site, the new site would get four and WP four tables would be created and so on and so on and so on. Okay. Um, M says, can you change an existing site into a multi-site and vice versa, multi-site, single site? Um, it is possible to change a single site into a multi-site. Uh, so if you have an existing site with content, with data, all those kind of things, you can still come back and make all those changes. As I mentioned earlier, in the in the suggestions and in the requirements, they do recommend doing a backup, because in that in that step of enabling multi-site in the config and then hitting uh, the network setup, entering that data and hitting submit, if something should uh, interact with that step and it breaks, you might lose your original data. Uh, so that's why it's recommended to do it from a clean site from the word go, but it is possible to do. Um, Multi-site to single site, uh, theoretically would be possible. Um, I'm not sure why you would do it unless you're talking about taking all the data from the single site and merging it back into the multi-site. You would need to do that manually. Uh, so, so while possible, not recommended. Um, and then Elena says, if one of the multi-sites has been hacked, will other multi-site websites also be influenced? That's a very good question. Uh, it depends on the hack. So if the hack is based on user access, somebody with user related, so let's say somebody hacks a username and password and is able to log into one of the sub-sites, they shouldn't be able to have uh, access to the main site or any of the other sites. Because while it's using the same installation, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the sites are not really talking to each other. However, if your main site is hacked, then that's going to give you access to everything. So it's the same level of security as a single site install. Um, again, it depends on the hack. It also depends on whether you have any plugins or themes installed that allow access to things that they shouldn't do. So I don't want to mention any names, but there was a plugin recently that there was quite a big um, security vulnerability uh, published. And it was related to administrator access not being checked. Um, if somebody got in based on that, they might be able to access some other pages if they knew where to go. Uh, they could possibly access the network admin page if the right user checks aren't in place. Um, so that's why it's another good idea to keep your plugins and themes updated. Um, make sure you're, you're following security vulnerability updates to make sure you keep things up to date. But with a default WordPress install, you should be safe if, if a single site does get hacked. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to show you very quickly today is kind of how the themes and the plugins work of things. So when I'm logged in as the network admin, if I go into my themes, you'll see that 2023 is network in what's known as network enabled, but 2021, 2022 are network disabled. So when I go to my sites, and I'm now going to switch to the dashboard of the main site, so it looks like a, a, a default dashboard that I'm used to, and I'm going to switch to the dashboard of my Bob site. Uh, let's go back to network admin. Let's go sites. Uh, let's go Bob dashboard. Here we go. Um, so I understand I'm logged in as the admin user now on this site. I'm going to log out to log in as Bob in a second. I'll show you some things there. Um, but you'll see if I go to the appearance themes option, um, I don't have the option to install any of the network deactivated themes, only the themes that have been activated for the network. So if I wanted to activate a theme for the network, um, I could go and I could say, uh, let's go back to the network side. Uh, let's go back to themes. And I could then network enable 2021, for example, and then allow certain sites to add or, or, or uh, remove it. Um, you'll also notice, so what I'm going to do very quickly now is I'm going to switch and I'm going to edit Bob because I want to change his password um, just to a simple password that I can remember. <clears throat> And I'm going to log into multipress.testbob as Bob, not as the network admin. 
So to do that, I'm going to open up a new incognito window and I'm going to go to multipress.testbob and I'm going to go to WP admin and I can do that as per normal on the subdomain, the, the, the redirection and all that works because I'm running a multi-site and I can log in as Bob and I can log in with a password. And you will see that when I go to the themes page, there are the themes that I can install. As a, this is, the, this is one of the things to, to sort of understand. As a, by default, as a subsite admin, I can't install themes. You see, I don't have the option to install themes. Um, if I go back to, let me minimize this. And if I go back to, here is the Bob user. And here we go. You will notice that I also can't enable those settings for Bob. So you are limited in terms of that. Your, your admins can't install themes. Um, let's go back to Bob over here. Um, find that, there we go. Uh, you'll also notice they can't install plugins. So that's also something to think about when you're, when you're thinking about if you wanna use multi-site. If you want your administrators for the different sites to be able to install their own themes and plugins, multi-site might not be the solution for you. Uh, if you don't mind, if you want to control it and only allow them to select from the themes that you've enabled, then multi-site might be a good, a good solution for you. That might be a solution if that's your specific requirement. You want an environment where folks can only install the themes that you allow, then a multi-site might be exactly what you need as an example. Um, Okay, so M says to explain the question, if you created a multi-site but didn't set up any subsites. Ah, I see what you're saying. Um, yes, that should be possible. Um, my understanding is that it's just effectively a case of removing all those constants from the um from the WP config and deleting the additional tables and and, and all the data that was added during the install. And then that should revert back to a, a standard single site installation. Um I've never done it before, so I can't say that for sure. Again, we could we could try that another day if you would like to. We could we could have some fun with it if you want to guarantee get the answer there. But theoretically, that should be possible. If you've if you've enabled multi-site, you haven't made any changes, and you realize you want to go back to single site, you should you effectively just roll back the changes that you've made. Um, the easier way to do that would be to make sure you've done the backup first, uh, and then just revert the backup. That'll be a lot easier than trying to because now you've got to delete tables. And there might be additional fields that you have to delete in certain, in, sorry, yeah, additional rows in certain tables. So better to just restore from a backup if that's the process you take. Um, okay, Linda says, can you point additional unique URLs to a subsite on your multi-site? Um, Linda, I assume by that what you mean is, let's say you have bob.multipress.test and you also want to point uh, charlie.multipress.test. Uh, my understanding is that is possible, but what will happen, uh, you can do that on the server level, um, but what, it'll, what it will be is it'll be a redirect, uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, if you have a look at the data, the domain is stored as multipress.test slash Bob. So if you register, say, charlie.multipress.test and you point it to, to Bob, then when it's looking up uh, images or those kind of things, it's going to be looking for it in charlie.multipress.test and it might not find it. So while it is theoretically possible, it does require a little bit of additional configuration on the server level. Um, okay, and then Elena says, do all multi-sites and the main site share the same bandwidth, bandwidth and influence each other? Um, the answer is effectively yes, because it is all just one WordPress install. Um, so, so, so it's going to be, it, you're not going to, you know, the, ba the bandwidth, the, the sort of people browsing your multi-site network, uh, they're going to be hitting that install. So let's say you have 10 sites and those 10 sites have a thousand active users. That's 10,000 active requests to your WordPress install. Um, so it's not going to be shared because it's a WordPress install. The, the server doesn't know that it's a WordPress install. The server just sees all the different um, requests. So you're not going to have a speed influence from switching to multi-site, as an example. Um, Linda says, for example, if I have multipress.bob, can I use an existing URL, such as example.com? Um, Linda, maybe you want to unmute and explain a little bit better what, you, what you're saying there. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm understanding 100%. You can certainly point it to the new site. 
Um, oh, I see what you're saying. You mean a top? You mean a top level domain to point to a subsite? Do you mean that? So if you have, uh, let's say, Charlie.com, and you want to point it to multi-site, say Charlie.multi-site or multi-site slash Charlie. Uh, again, you can point it, uh, but I don't think it's possible to. It's the same thing. Like the um, this is getting a little bit onto the server level side of things, and I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Um, I'm trying to think. I do think it's possible, and I'll tell you why. As we mentioned earlier, WordPress.com is essentially a big multi-site, um, and WordPress.com supports custom domains. Um, so I want to say it is possible, and then I'm going to add by saying, but it probably requires some server-level configuration that I don't know offhand. Um, so I'll need to check that one out. I'm, I'm, I'll make a note. Uh, let me just, um, would it be a redirect? You could do it with a redirect, but then as I mentioned earlier, with a redirect, it means that your resources are going to be looked for on the subdomain. So if you're happy with that, if you wanted to say, let's say somebody searches for charlie.com and then on the server, it redirects to multipress.com slash charlie. If you're happy with that, it means the user is going to see multipress.test slash charlie or charlie.whatever, that will work. So you can redirect top level domain. But if you want to have it so that the, the address doesn't ever change, but it serves the content on the on the subsite, it is, I would say, theoretically possible, but it requires some server level configuration that I'm not, I don't remember or have in my head at this point in time. Um, yes, probably using DNS settings or something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a note of this uh, in my in my issue for this for this uh, for this session. And just double check about the uh, top level domain to to multi site subsite. Um, there's probably some answers on the internet uh, that would give you the answer for that, but I'll, I'll go and find out, and I'll just come back with sort of a definitive answer, and maybe link off to some things and, and check with some folks. Um, okay, awesome. All right. Um, so that's how you create a multi site network. That's what happens in the background when a multi site ne network is created. Um, there's a whole bunch you can do with a multi-site network. I'm not going to dive into those things now, um, but but there's a whole bunch of stuff you can play around with and have fun with. Um, next week, we're going to be looking at, um, I need to remember here. Uh, I'm not going to remember. I have it. Just give me a second here. Uh, online workshop. I'm going to go, I'm going to go find this off screen quickly because I, it requires me to log into uh, a personal thing. And then I'm going to find the workshop calendar that I'm looking for. And then I will let you know what we're covering next week because it's it's gone from my brain. Um, next week, we're going to be looking at um, how, okay, so we've kind of covered it today, but it's how a multi-site install differs from a single site. Uh, so we're really gonna, we're gonna dive into the database changes. We're gonna dive into uh, plugins and themes and how they work and users and things and how they work. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the things that are set up with a multi-site network, some of the things that you can access. And then the week after that, we might we might change track a little bit. I'll see when I've done the research. But then either next week or the week after that, we'll also be looking at when you're developing themes and plugins for a multi-site network, what are the things that you need to be aware of? Uh, and we're going to dive into, into how that how that works. Um, okay, there's some more questions. So M says it would be great to have a separate session on converting multi to single and taking a subsite out of the network. Mad science experiments. Yes, I'm going to actually, I'm going to, Emma, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to copy your comment there and I'm going to paste it in the comments here. So I have it as, I love the mad science experiments uh, comment. You you read my mind there. Um, I'm going to paste that into the comments here because I might find when I do my research, what I wanted to cover next week, I've already covered. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, so I'm going to pop that in the comments. Um, Jeff says, I have a multi-site setup with multiple domains pointing to the same install. Uh, okay, so Jeff, Jeff, it sounds like he has things all set up there. So that's great. He might be able to give us some examples. Um, M says, again, if you have an existing site, can you create a multi-site main site above it to keep the first site as a subsite? That I don't actually have an answer to. Um, I'm pretty sure that the single site needs to be the main site. Uh, but let me make a note of that and find out. Uh, so I'm going to pop that in my questions here as well. And maybe next week will just be a questions and answers session about multi-sites based on all of these things here. Um, but that I don't, to the best of my knowledge, it needs to be the main site first. Um, but let me find out and get back to you. 
Um, while Jeff, while Jeff is checking in on his his multiple domains pointed to the same install, um, as I say, my understanding is it is possible, uh, but it does require some some configurations. Um, okay, any other questions around all of this that we've gone through? Uh, while Jeff is looking in there, um, the two the two articles that I've shared with you are sort of the definitive definitive um, doc, pieces of documentation that you need to read. Basically, what we've done today is just go through um, and go through all of these things. Uh, it talks about uh, administration. It talks about multi-site network administration. Um, when you enable the multi-site network, it creates a, a super admin. So there's different roles and capabilities there. So this gets back to, to the question that I think uh, Lena had earlier around security. So your, your single site admins um, they have certain permissions and, and roles and capabilities, and then your super admin has other ones. So if a user on a, an admin user on a single site got hacked, they wouldn't be able to do the same things that a super admin could, for example. So it does sort of protect security up the chain kind of thing uh, in that way. Um, and then there are some related articles around um, what we're going to be cover going to be covering down the line. Okay, um, Jeff, I don't know if you've had a chance to have a look at how your setup is there. Um, there's another question. Can subsites pull media on the main site? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the uh, let's actually show you that quickly. That's a good point. Let me actually show you that. I don't know if it's going to be set up yet. Uh, it might be. Uh, no, it won't. So let me actually just add some media to the sites. Um, so let's go to the multipress site and let's go to the Bob site and let's add an image. I don't know if I've got any images lying around. Um, I think I do. Yeah, there's a WordCamp Europe something picture that I can use. Um, okay, Jeff's about to post some screenshots there. So while he's doing that, I'm going to, so there's an image that I uploaded. Sorry, I'm just moving my screen here. There's an image that I uploaded to the Bob site. And now I'm going to upload a separate image to the, um, the main site. Let's find a different image. Let's do the GitHub Copilot one. Uh, and then I want to show you what happens in the actual site install. So when we go to the uploads directory, you'll see that there is a sites um, folder. Uh, and then there is inside the 2023 that's uploaded the, the GitHub to Copilot. So it creates this sites too. Let me actually show you that in a, it's easier to see it in a, in a file browser as opposed to, um, can you see the file browser on my screen right now? I don't think you can um because of what i've shared yeah that's what i thought okay um let me do this let me just stop the share very quickly and i'm going to specifically share the whole screen uh, if i can um oh, i don't think i can so i'm just going to share my finder window now so you should see my my finder window which is the file browser uh, and if i go into multipress and I go into WP content. Um, okay, Jeff says he needs permission to upload screenshots. Uh, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind um, doing me a favor uh, and uh, I don't know how to actually enable that. So um, let me let me do this. Um, okay, let me see if I can figure this out. Um, um, this is, sorry, I'm in the chat. I need to be in, in the participants window. Okay, here we go. Let me find Jeff. And Jeff, I hope we can trust you, my friend. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, um, let me just see if I can, yeah, I don't know how this works. Okay. I, I'll actually I'll actually share my email address in the chat. I don't mind. It's public. Uh, it's jonathanbossinger at gmail.com. So if you wouldn't mind sending those through, uh, and then I'll open them up once we've had a look at the file browser. So Jeff, if you could send those through so long. Uh, let me get back to the file browser, which is somewhere here. So can you still see my WP content folder, I hope? Um, so if I go into the uploads directory, you'll see there is in the sites directory, there is a site number two, and that contains my images that I installed on the Bob site. And then there is the default um, 2023.04, which is installing the, the main site images. So if I created a site three, it would create a three in the sites folder, and then the media would be shared there. So the reason we did that was because uh, Linda said, said, can subsites pull media on the main site? So 
They can't access the media because it's in a separate location, but obviously most media is public. So you would be able to maybe using something like the WordPress REST API or just the URL to the image, you could include it in content somewhere, but you can't access it. You can't, while you're creating a post or a page in a subsite, access the media in the top level site because it's physically separate. Um, and that gets back to what we were chatting about earlier, where don't think of the multi-site network as a interconnected network of sites. Um, it's just a, a bunch of different sites that happen to be running on the same WordPress install, using the same folder structure. Everything is housed within the same space, but they don't necessarily have ways to talk to each other. Um, if you were wanting to build something that allowed them to talk to each other, the REST API is a good example. There's some there's some workshops out there about the REST API you might remember. Um, so that's one way to do it. You could you could make a request to the REST API of the one site to pull data in that way or content or whatever that way. Uh, there are some plugins that allow sites to talk to each other. So those are the ways you would you would go about it. Um, I'm going to open up my Gmail account while we're here to see if if we can get those screenshots from Jeff, uh, so we can see what that looks like. Um, so just give me one second here, and thank you, Jeff, for sharing those. I do appreciate it. Um, and I don't mind sharing my public email because I'm very good at ignoring what I need to ignore. Um, okay, so here we go. So Jeff has sent some things through from super admin level. So I'm going to open those up in screen here. So so site URL, home URL is, is set up. Um, sharp fan criticism on art and literature. Interesting. Uh, and let me move this out the way here. And then uh, he's got different administrators. Uh, the top level URL is there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's set up in a certain way. So these are the kind of things that I'm probably going to go into next week. Um, so I'll actually see if I can set up on my local environment, um, a couple of, a couple of sort of top level domains and see if I can point them to sites. And you might've all given me some, some good, good fodder for my next workshop. So thank you for that. Um, I really do appreciate these questions because this helps me prepare. These are the things that I want to know. Um, so when you when you have when you have those questions that I can't answer, it gives me it gives me topics that I can use for future workshops. So thank you for that. Uh, oh, you couldn't see the screenshots. Oh, I apologize. This this Zoom screen sharing thing. Um, let me let me stop share, and let me open up my email again. Sorry, folks. Um, Zoom used to be able to allow you to just share the desktop, and then whatever was on the desktop was sh was shared. But it seems to be not the case anymore. Um, so here we go. So here's the multi-site admin from Jeff. Uh, I'm now going to start the share again. Um, yeah, the domain mapping on the server level. That's what I thought. There would be some domain mapping required. Um, so let me share my screen now. I want this one. Uh, and let's share that. So now you should see the settings. So as you can see, Jeff is using WP Engine. Um, so this is his uh, network admin. So the site is tasteful root. That's the URL. Um, and then the next one is is this different sites. Uh, these are the users on the site. Um, and then this is a I'm guessing this is an individual site. So he's actually set the the site URL in the site itself uh, to whatever. So it looks like, yeah, absolutely, Linda, to to answer your question as Jeff has pointed out for us, thank you, Jeff, that it is possible to set that up. Um, it probably just requires some 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 DNS settings to enable it. Um, but it certainly does look like it's possible. And I've learned something today. I didn't even know that was possible. I've never used multi-site in, in that way. I've only ever used it either as a subdomain setup or the subdirectory setup. Um, so now I'm keen to learn how that works. So I will go and do some research uh, and I will report back uh, next week. Um, so shall I just call next week's workshop um, answers to your questions <laughs> about multi-site um, and maybe get some other folks who might have watched this, this session to, to respond with their questions. I think that would be a good way to, to prepare the next session. Okay, um, this was planned for an hour, but we went over time and that's great. I don't mind at all, um, but I do need to, to start wrapping up. Uh, yes, Linda says multi-site part duo. I like it. Um, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Jeff, M, Linda, Alana, everybody else that I couldn't think of. Um, for your for your questions. Um, it was great to work through all of those with you and stay tuned for whatever next week's going to be. It's going to be answers to some questions. It's going to be diving into the changes and the differences. I will take those questions and I will set up some examples of how those will work and, and report back. Uh, but please do enjoy the rest of your Thursday and the rest of your weekend. And I will see you again. We should just call it multi -pro I love that M. We should just call it multi-site mad experiments. That's what we should just call next week's session. Um, <laughs> mad science experiments. Great. Thank you all for joining me. It was lovely to see you all and have a great rest of your day. Bye.